Hey, Thomas. Hey, Dr. Cruz. Hey, Okay. Hi. So, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started here then? And we'll uh, carry on where we left off before. Uh, we went through the first four, which are the traditional, classical, uh, Steve Snyder slap tears. And then we'll go on to the additional one. Now, the next one that was described is the type five slap tear, which are pretty, pretty common. They're basically bank cart tears anteriorly here, which extends superiorly to involve the superior labrum. And so we can see here, uh, there's been a tear of the anterior labrum, which has pulled off a little bit with its capsular insertion here inferiorly. So that's an anterior uh, tear. And then if we uh, look on the coronal images, uh, we can follow that tear all the way up and it dissects up to involve the superior labrum and a little bit of the biceps anchor here as well. So this would be a type five slap tear in that location. So uh, let's see, Chef, what do you think of this? Okay, uh, so it looks like we have a high grade, probably near full thickness tear of the supraspinatus. So it probably is here, yep. And then I see some high signal within the uh, superior labrum there. Oops, wait, what's going on here? Where is it? Hold it. <laughs> Why is this not working properly? Oh. Sorry, I don't know why it skipped like that. Okay, so we have that up there. And then if we follow it, let's just do it in here. Okay. Um, this is, somehow I went backwards. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry about that. So that was a displaced tear. Okay. Uh, well, let's see here. So here we have someone who has a, a hill sax, an old hill sax packed injury here. And here we can, if we follow it down, we, uh, this is nonspecific. This could certainly be just a superior recess here. This looks like it's too separated here, but again, the distance of separation here is not very specific. Uh, <clears throat> but then if we follow it here, and then if we follow it, that's continuous with the anterior labral tear here going down to the anterior inferior labrum with a little bit of irregularity of the, of the glenoid down here. So this was uh, someone who had an anterior dislocation and with it had a type five slap tear, which is really a, a band current lesion, which extends up to the uh, superior labrum. And we can see the, those findings there. Now a type six tear uh, is, a, is an unstable tear of the anchor where the anchor kind of falls off. Uh, with the tear of the superior labrum. And so here we can see that this is separated. Uh, uh, the difference between a type two and a type six is been very difficult for me to differentiate in the literature. Uh, and I don't know how important it is. You basically have a, a tear that involves the, the base of the, uh, of the anchor. A type seven, is a tear that involves the base of the anchor, the superior labrum, and then extends longitudinally involving the, uh, the middle glenohumeral ligament, in this case. And then here we can see there's a, a tear here, uh, down into this area, and it's kind of extending out uh, into, this is the labrum, that's the middle glenohumeral ligament taking off. This is the middle glenohumeral ligament. And if you follow it out, the tear goes longitudinally along the middle glenohumeral ligament. I, I haven't seen very many of those. Okay, let's see. Shiv, what do you think of this case? All right, so I see bone marrow edema and the uh, greater tuberosity of the humeral head, and I see linear hyperintense signal in the superior ligament. Okay. And here it looks like, again, I see some high signal in the greater tuberosity of the humeral head and then sort of this ill-defined area in the expected yeah. region of the anterior now, One of the reasons I'm not a big fan of arthrography is often when you stick the needle in here, you can inject all kinds of different structures here, including it's not uncommon to stick the needle into the middle glenohumeral ligament, mm -hmm. and you can inadvertently inject into that. So it makes 
the termination of, of some of these tears a little bit more unsure here. But if we follow this down, we can see that there's abnormal labrum here, it's thickened. The middle glenohumeral ligament is very indistinct in through here. So if you follow all the way down, uh, this was a, a longitudinal tear that was going into the middle glenohumeral ligament. Uh, if you ask most, uh, most of the surgeons that I've asked concerning this, this doesn't really affect their management. I don't think, I don't, I don't know anyone who'd actually repair a middle glenohumeral ligament. So, again, okay. Now, so type, was, yeah? Was that torn, that middle glenohumeral ligament was torn? Or yes, it was torn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, a type 8 is basically a type 2, but extends posteriorly until instead of anteriorly. So, again, I much. I'll say it the, the 3,000th time. Instead of using these different types that everybody has to go back in the book to look up, and most orthopedic surgeons don't use the ones above uh, type 4 unless it's a research project, uh, I really strongly recommend in a report only to state where the tear is and where it extends to. So this one extends along posteriorly here. Do you get clock faces when you're extending or describing the yeah. extent of the tear? You can, you can use clock faces. I don't, but, but a lot of people do. Okay. With the clock face being the glenoid fossa. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so here we have a cyst type uh, I think eight I had slap a lot tear. Of That's right. Yeah. Go ahead. This is a type eight slap tear, and there's two views. Mm -hmm. So, so what what do you see for a type eight? Well, well, it's the title. There. Let's see. So it should <laughs> extend. Uh, so explain to us why this is a type eight. Should extend uh, posteriorly. Um, so I see a, a tear there in the superior aspect, and then uh, this is um, an axial view, and I see that it's extending posteriorly there, yeah, maybe a linear tear of the uh, labrum. Uh, yes, going down, it extends more posteriorly, and that's more a certain inferior aspect. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Yeah. And so this is just another one where we can see, again, this would be a nonspecific finding here. It could be just a superior recess. But if you follow it, it goes down and involves a posterior labrum here and extends down. Now, what I've generally found is when you get in these higher order slap tears, uh, most patients don't fit neatly into any one category. They often have categories of all the different uh, um, more complicated slap injuries. Again, a reason why I'm, I'm not a big fan of memorizing the different types of slap tears and, and using that in a report. Uh, and this one just kind of changed a little bit from, from uh, one year to the next. It was initially a type six and it became a, uh, onto a type eight. So, uh, with a, and then it eventually had a biceps rupture. So a type 9 slap tear is really a circumferential tear. Often the labrum inferiorly here is intact, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Described by uh, an orthopedic surgeon in Santa Barbara, Rick Ryu. And here we can see uh, tears anteriorly and posteriorly. This one goes down and involves the inferior labrum as well. And then it also involves a superior labrum. So this is really a circumferential tear of the labrum. So I don't even know why you call it a slap tear. It's basically a circumferential tear. And the superior labrum is just one of the components that's involved in it. Another example, here we have a tear. We can see a little paralabral cyst here with it. Uh, and then uh, extending it. It goes all the way up to the top. So this is inferiorly, this is superiorly, and we have a tear with with associated paralabral cysts. And then there's a type 10 uh, superior tear which extends into the, uh, the rotator cuff interval. I, I find that often very hard to differentiate just on MR images. And at least most of the surgeons I know don't really treat this in any differently than the others. So the, the caution here is in the radiology literature, the slap tear is this which was described, I think, by Javier Beltran. But in the orthopedic literature, a slap uh, 10 lesion is also used to describe a type 2 lesion plus a chem lesion, posteriorly inferiorly. So, uh, let's see. Uh, 
Sam, what do you Campbell, uh, John uh, Campbell's goes to six uh, okay. areas uh, of the glenoid, uh, and, 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 and then they use Snyder's uh, classification. They don't go to 10, as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but this must be something new. No, no, these these were all described 10 years ago. Uh, well, then Snyder, uh, well, Campbell's didn't think it's worth putting in there, I guess. Yeah, this is primarily in the radiology literature, not in the orthopedic literature. Oh, well, of course, then you, you have about 15. <laughs> right. So, Sam, what do you think of this case? Well, there's certainly a slap tear. I, I think the bottom right-hand image, the smaller image there, I guess there's a little bit of signal undercutting minimally. Um, I guess there would have to be if it's a type 10. So, yeah. that'll be the really. So, this one, that's uh, really a type 6 unstable uh, uh, slap tear there. And then if we... And then you know we can see that there's extension anteriorly, and uh, and then you could follow it extending both anteriorly and posteriorly. Uh, and this would basically be a type three here. So uh, and this one also extends into the interval here, which is going into the rotator cuff interval. In this case, we have a paralabral cyst. So. And here's another case where you have a slap tear with a paralabral cyst with extension into the interval area as well around the middle glenohumeral ligament. And extending down here, the middle glenohumeral ligament and the anterior labrum. Now that was in a picture. So uh, uh, this will be the last time I'll say it. I, I don't recommend that you use the numbers unless you just use the first four, because those are pretty much recognized by all orthopedic surgeons. The rest of them I would recognize that these are areas you need to look for, and if you see extension of the tear into those areas, I would just describe it in the report. It's my recommendation. So, Thomas, what do you think of this case? A uh, 55-year-old female with pain, patient had a history of osteolysis in the left femoral head, needing to use a walker. Uh, sort of a coronal view of the right shoulder, uh, there's sort of diffuse synovial thickening and synovitis. Uh, there's a defect in the medial aspect of the humeral head, and there's some superior ascent of the humeral head. And I think the cuff is looks uh, completely torn and retracted. Um, so yeah, I suspect something like an kind of in, inflammatory uh, process with the origin. Oops, I went to that picture there, sorry. Sorry. Okay, here, here are the next images. Okay, so it looks uh, like there's the pre and post contrast axial view, and there's diffuse synovial enhancement and thickening. Uh, so it's kind of a diffuse synovitis, inflammatory. Yeah. component and all the bone marrow edema and impaction of the humerus, high riding humeral head all the things you said right um yeah and the sagittal view the glenoid so so there's some deformity yeah, there yeah the, the thing i kind of want to point out here the head is very much superiorly migrated. We, we can see that there's probably been an impaction injury here. But it looks very highly migrated, uh, more so than we would normally see. So why do you think that it's actually subluxing so much above the glenoid when usually it's stopped by the acromion process? Um, I mean, the glenoid looks abnormal. So what about the space between here and here is actually what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, is the coracoclavicular distance in, increased? Yeah. So so what you actually have here are tears of the coracoclavicular ligaments here. 
Stacy Logan. And you've got, in order to, to have so much dislocation, and here's that impaction injury in the glenoid, you actually have mm -hmm. uh, uh, unstable uh, chromium. You actually have the, the scapula, the, uh, uh, yeah, the CC ligaments have been torn. So this is a patient okay. who, uh, because they've been using the walker over and over again with a lot of strain up on their on their uh, humeral heads, it's caused a uh, tear of the CC ligaments and superior dislocation of the, of the humeral head. Okay. So, and then you can have um, kind of multidirectional instability where you have tears everywhere, which is kind of the type nine uh, slap tears. Uh, now, there are several measurements that some people like to use uh, in evaluating this. One is the inferior labral capsular distance, uh, uh, here to here, <clears throat> and there are measurements for it. Uh, to get it reproducible, you really have to put contrast into it and have an arthrogram. Personally, I, I haven't found this to be uh, to be a, a, a very helpful measurement, but uh, uh, people have described it and have normals uh, for mm -hmm. that particular distance. But I think that the amount of volume in the capsule we know varies a lot from person to person, uh, even without uh, pathology. So uh, I'm just not sure how valuable that that measurement is. So, uh, let's see, Sahar, what do you think of this case? One year old male stem school fall two weeks ago on abducted shoulder. So there is tendinosis of the subscapularis, maybe partial tearing of the dorsal surface under the edema in the yeah. There's edema in the lesser tuberosity of the edema head. I don't see discrete fractions on traction injury, traffic level injury. And there is tear of the posterior capsule. I see. Yep. So what do you think has happened here? So there was like a posterior dislocation. Okay, it was an abducted shoulder. And we can actually have some hemorrhage here. This is a, these are a few cuts further down. Yeah. Okay, and so that was really a, a posterior dislocation on someone who fell on an abducted shoulder. Right. Okay. Uh, normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Looks like the... Uh, Glenoid is inferiorly directed. The humeral head is dislocated, sort of inferiorly, yeah. I guess. And there's large osteophytes. Intonation carlides, hypertrophic bone, yeah. rotator cuff tears. This is kind of end stage disease that you can get with chronic instability. So we can talk about some of the complications we can get with this. There's the biceps tear, paralabral and logic. John, did you have something to say? Yeah, there's, uh, I think, nerve injury in that last one. Probably so. I think you're right. Yep. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so when you have these lesions, one is a, a biceps tear. This is a biceps anchor tear, which you can see there. And there's a little paralabral cyst right in the area where we have the, the superior labral tear. So that's a slap with a cyst. Uh, the, the, the sagittal plane is a very nice plane to see the anatomy of the different muscles. There's the pectoralis major, the minor, serratus anterior down here, uh, tra tra trapezius, we all know the rotator cuff uh, muscles, but then the, the triceps is the one most posteriorly in, in here. The one kind of centrally is the teres major, and then inferiorly and anteriorly is the latissimus dorsi. Uh, and these can be in, in, injured in athletes, and it's an area that's uh, somewhat overlooked. It's often a corner shot on the images. But in the athlete who has pain uh, after either weightlifting or a heavy exercise, don't forget to try to look at these muscles. And if you remember, this muscle and this muscle are the primary muscles that are involved in the speed of a fastball. So these are two muscles that are not uncommonly injured and athletes, especially if they're baseball players, and they're trying to build up their muscles for, for throwing. So uh, you're all familiar with the suprascapular and spinal glenoid notches. Uh, these are areas where you can have pathology, often in the form of 
cysts, sometimes paralabral cysts, which extend into these areas, and then they can uh, uh, cause compression of the nerves and uh, nerve syndromes. So uh, uh, up above here is the suprascapular nerve, which comes down in through this and, and the artery. Uh, this is uh, of the superior transverse ligament. And then this is the area of the supraspinatus notch, uh, or su suprascapular notch. And then you can see that uh, innervation from the nerve in this location will go to the supraspinatus muscle. Uh, so if you have uh, a involvement of the suprascapular notch area, and I think you all know this, what you'll tend to get is denervation problems of both the supraspinatus and all the muscles that are innervated more distally, which includes the infraspinatus muscle. The teres minor is innervated primarily by, by a different nerve, so it's usually spared in this problem. So if you have a, a cyst or mass in this location, it gets both muscles. If you have one in the spinal glenoid notch, which is more inferiorly here, the supraspinatus will be spared, and you'll just get involvement of the infraspinatus muscle. So here are where those notches are located on uh, MR examination. The suprascapular region is up and through here. The spinal glenoid notch is down here. And in the quadrilateral space is where uh, the, the recurrent, the, uh, sorry, what is it? It's the axillary nerve. Axillary nerve, thank you. <laughs> axillary nerve goes through, uh, which extends to, to the, uh, uh, Terry's minor muscle. So there, there are a lot of reasons why you can get neuropathy in these areas. Uh, uh, you can have trauma, but generally speaking for what we see, it's usually associated with a mass, most typically uh, cysts, uh, but you could also have malignancies in these locations which can also af uh, af affect them. Uh, and the other thing is if you have a more generalized loss, uh, you always have to remember that if you don't see anything in the uh, suprascapular and, and the spinal glenoid notches, you have to think about more proximal potential lesions, uh, like in the cervical spine. So paralabral cysts are the most common in my experience, uh, which can extend into these areas and produce, uh, produce weakness. Uh, it's not uncommon in high-level athletes, especially baseball players, to see focal atrophy of uh, one of these muscles, uh, with the others quite hypertrophied, and, but without evidence of a cyst or any abnormalities in these notches. I don't know the real reason for that. It could be that they just injured the muscle by weightlifting or in some exercise and injured the nerve, and therefore you got uh, uh, atrophy from just a traumatic injury. Or it could be that they had a, a paralabral cysts in the past, uh, they've either been corrected or they've gone away, uh, but you're just left with a neuropathy, neuropathy from, uh, from the cyst that existed before. Uh, and it can be a, in either notch. So this would be a, uh, a typical uh, cyst lower down, a ganglion cyst, which could be affecting the spinal glenoid notch and the infraspinatus muscle. So here's a 23, who's next? Let's see, who's last? Okay. Okay. So this is a 23-year-old male. They want to. They're concerned about a contusion or a rotator cuff tear. Okay. So I see a paralabral cyst in the region of the spinal glenoid notch and superior labral tear. Okay. So I'd be worried about the infraspinatus in this case. What else do you see here? Atrophy of the infraspinatus. You don't see the infraspinatus. I see, yeah. I see the supra. Okay, so here's the supra. What's its signal intensity? It's hyper intense. It's, it's hyper intense. So there's edema in the supraspinatus. Here are the sagittal images. So again, I see the cyst. And the supraspinatus itself looks not too. Yeah, well, it's, it's, too it's higher in signal intensity than the other muscles. And the superior aspect of the infraspinatus is higher. And uh, the, in, the inferior aspect of the, uh, of the infraspinatus muscle uh, is commonly innervated by the axillary nerve, as is the teres minor. So what you see here very nicely 
is the, the innervation uh, location uh, for the suprascapular nerve. And so this is a fairly high up where it's affecting gotcha. uh, the branches to both. This would be up in the suprascapular region. Ready? So, uh, okay. Pablo, what do you think of this one? So we have uh, two actual views, and there's a cyst posterior to the glenoid, and that's the spinal glenoid notch. Um, there's atrophy of the, what's that? That's the infraspinatus. Yeah, so there's severe atrophy of the infraspinatus. And we can see the, the tear of the posterior labrum, a lot of bone injury here, cartilage injury as well. So that's really a paralabral cyst. There's the tear, there's the cyst, there's the cyst. And then on the sagittal images, what do you think of the muscles? Um, so the supraspinatus is normal, but the infraspinatus is atrophic. And yeah. uh, the interspinar is normal. Okay. So, so this is the more distal lesion in the spinal glenoid notch. And we can see the denervation, atrophy, and edema within the infraspinatus muscle from this. So uh, occasionally, uh, the pathology reads the textbooks. <laughs> Not always, but occasionally. OK. Sam, what do you th think of this case? <clears throat> There's a cyst, um, probably uh super scapular notch i mean and i don't see a lot of edema or atrophy and then here if we see the, here's the arthrogram you can see a, there's well, a there's a tear sorry a little cyst yeah yeah, yeah well, let's skip this one there's actually uh, very subtle signal changes here but okay. uh, let me skip it take this one instead maybe spinal glenoid then in this on this image but um, so there's a, there's a, this is in the same patient, I guess, huh? So no, there, there's, no. a, there's a label to posterior, yeah. inferior label to, yes. This is a different patient. Different patient, thank you. Uh, posterior inferior uh, label tear with a paralabal cyst. Where's um, the cyst? Or not a cyst, sorry, this is an orthogram. Yeah, it's an orthogram. Okay, it's a T1 weighted image. Here we have the arthrographic fluid and we have the posterior labral tear, right? Yeah. Okay, and here's the T2 weighted image. Nice. Okay, so there is the paralabral cyst. You can't cyst without seeing it. <laughs> You're clairvoyant, Sam. Yeah. So, so what's going on here? Yeah, I guess it just has an accumulated contrast. So, so I, I don't see a lot of signal changes in the muscles, but certainly yeah. there's a cyst there. So I just want to remind everybody that with these chronic tears, they may seal off, and they may not fill with orthographic contrast. Again, it's, mm -hmm. it's important to have fluid-sensitive images to see this very large cyst back here, uh, which we can see. It seems obvious, but it's still, I still occasionally will see orthograms they only have T1 fat set images on all three planes. Okay, and then here's just another example. We see all these cysts around here. And in this case, there's a little bit of filling of the cyst, but the cyst is this whole thing, but only a little bit of the insides of the cyst actually fills. And the same thing down here, just a little bit of filling. If you wait over time, the contrast will typically diffuse into the rest of it. But in the time frame that we typically do arthrography, uh, you may you may not see the full cyst fill. So, okay, uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? A uh, forty-six-year-old male shot and left while wearing a bulletproof Kevlar jacket. Uh, so the frontal view, the chest, and I don't see any pneumothorax, meniscus midline, and the shoulder. So he's internally rotated. The scapula looks a little bit, so it's high riding relative to the right. And very much so. <laughs> okay, here's some more. It's way up here. 
Right. Uh, so, so, so John, so, John, you're good. Is how would you describe this? Well, this capital is um, superiorly displaced. Right. Yeah. So we have that. And, uh, and, and uh, ergo, all the other structures with it. Yeah. So this is scaphothoracic dissociation uh, due to the trauma and the force. It's really just uh, 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 basically dislocated the scapula and rotated it uh, up posteriorly. All right. So then we can get down to the quadru quadrilateral space, also called the quadrangular space. I name it because it kind of looks like a square between the muscles that form it. Inferiorly, it's the teres major muscle. Superiorly, it's the teres minor. Medially, long head of the biceps tendon. And laterally, it's the medial side of the humeral neck. So this is the area we're talking about right down in, in through here. And through here go the axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex artery. And that nerve primarily innervates the teres minor muscle and a little bit of the inferior aspect of the infraspinatus muscle. The uh, quadrilateral space syndrome is caused by something that, that affects the function of the axillary nerve. That can be caused by fibrous bands in this space, paralabal cysts, or rarely uh, uh, tumors or hematomas there. Uh, most, fr I haven't seen it all that often, but most of the cases I've seen have been inferior labral tears with large paralabral cysts. I've also seen it with uh, masses, including lipomas, which can get large enough to do it as well. Uh, and occasionally you can have metastatic disease affecting the, the nodes, which can then affect it. Uh, typically in young adults associated with a dull pain, and these are often misdiagnosed. So uh, you have to always have this in the back of your mind whenever you look at an MR scan. And typically what you'll see is focal atrophy of the teres minor muscle. Another reason why we have to evaluate the, uh, whether or not there's atrophy of all the muscles, but especially the four muscles of the rotator cuff, uh, always. The, vast, the, the majority of the time that I see isolated teres minor atrophy, however, the quadrilateral space is normal. So, uh, but occasionally it's abnormal and that can completely change the management if it is. Okay. All right. Well, that kind of includes uh, all of the, the things I want to talk about in terms of instability of the shoulder. So uh, let's see. What time is it? Well, we've got a little bit of time. Uh, so what I think I'll do is everyone, I'm going to, I'm going to have to, uh, Let's see. Oops. I'm going to cut out of GoToMeeting so that it could generate the, uh, the recording.